Hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Christian Sepulveda. I'm an executive manager of uh, Concentrate Solar Power Association, Chile, South America. Uh, nice to talk to you, to everybody, and thanks to be honored and uh, to be present in today's webinar. Uh, we call it Research and Development, How to Optimize CSP in Chile. Today, we are going to, uh, we are glad to uh, received the presence of uh, one person from, from Hofer, Germany, Mr. Gregor Byrne. He's a doctor engineer. He's a renewable energy system graduate of Technical University of Berlin, Germany, and holds a PhD from the Department of Elect Electrical Engineering and Information Technology of Culture Institute of Technology in Germany. Okay. He joins uh, Frank Hofer Institute for Solar Reserve Energy System on the 2012, and he's currently leading the group of concentrated collecting and uh, Optimix. He has been working in a leading national and international industry projects where the field uh, are collecting design and optimization of optical reflector and quality assignments. Um, but before that, we would like to give some introduction who and who is uh, uh, ACSP Chile. Concentrate Solar Power Association Chile. Uh, we are. Um, one brand new uh, association, five years old. We started in October 18, 2018. Right now, we are 25 member of uh, a CSP value of change, which included uh, development of CSP, like the first um, a CSP project in South America and Latin America, the name Cerro Dominador, who belongs to the holdings energy group, the name Grupo Cerro. Uh, beside of uh, Cerro Dominador, we have developed another development that like Spanish companies, Avengoa, Sener, and others developments of uh, current uh, the technology, plus uh, glass provider, the engineering, um, a supply of uh, solar collector, solar receiver, and uh, so on, on. Okay. What is the CSP industry? Uh, in a summary, CSP is to receive the reflection uh, through a mirror of the top of a uh, big, big construction. Right now, for example, Cerro del Minador on the left is um, 220 uh, meters tall, which is the second building uh, tour in, in Chile right now. And uh, we reflect the um, suns from through the mirrors up to the top of the, of the tower up to 550, 70 degree, where you're gonna melt salt, then we're going to receive a storage in a, a tank hot, cold, named hot cold tank. And then we use a turbine uh, with uh, water and then with the steam, use a turbine and we produce energy. After that, and the close cycle, uh, we um, call the, the, the salt up to 260 average uh, Celsius degree, the salt in order to avoid the uh, solidification of the salt and then start the project again. There are different kinds of technology of CSP. Uh, in Chile, we are working especially with the um, one uh, CSP and towel, but it could be uh, also developing parabolic throw which is a different uh, kind of technology, which include like a uh, um, uh, special kind of oil, which is gonna be uh, hotted the, 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 the technology instead of uh, a molten salt. Chile has a, a privileged country and it's privileged conditions, uh, especially uh, because our DNA uh, is absolutely, absolutely um, much better in comparison with the other part of the, of the, of the world. Right now we have uh, DNI, uh, concentrated solar uh, 
in Chile, between 3,500 up to 4,000 4, kilowatt per, 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 uh, per year, which is uh, so much in, interesting uh, uh, worldwide and crosswide. And uh, after this is the industry that we are developing. And um, according to our study, CSP uh, future could be developed uh, mainly in the north part of Chile, especially in uh, Tarapacá regions and Antofagasta and Atacama. So according to that, uh, Gregor will introduce some achievements and some new projects regarding how we could uh, reach and develop and optimize uh, CSP in Chile. Gregor, are you there? Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, let me finish my presentation. Ah, we have some uh, feedback, uh, Lupak. So now, yeah, I'm, I'm there, thank you. I think my camera is off, I'll switch it on. So, hello. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So, I see I cannot hear you via my computer, that is still... Yeah. So now, I think now I can hear you and can you hear me well? I think so. Um, yes, well, I can then, hear you, yeah. Please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Great, then I will start and share my presentation. So... Yes, it's fine. Okay. Great, thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to speak here at uh, ACSP. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm, I'm here to yeah, introduce a bit on, on what we are doing at uh, Fraunhofer Institute for uh, Solar Energy Systems in Germany on uh, the field of CSP with maybe a special focus on, um, on Chile, where uh, I must say we are uh, also uh, very nicely uh, collaborating with our colleagues here from Fraunhofer Chile. So, um, yeah, I was asked to talk about how to optimize um, CSP in Chile, or I, I decided to make it how to optimize the energy conversion in Chile, since uh, Chile itself is already regarded as somewhat the optimum for CSP. So, um, yeah, let me just uh, start with a short introduction of um, my institute or of the Fraunhofer Society itself. So we are, um, yeah, fun. We are, we are based in Germany, um, and there we have the role of doing a very applied research. So we are inspired by a, a person called Josef von Fraunhofer, who lived in the 18th, 19th century. Um, who is known for uh, the discovery of the Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum, where he used, used to work as a researcher um, and, and finding out about what, what light is about, what it, is, what it does, how it passes um, through the atmosphere um, to us. On the other hand, he was also uh, an inventor for um, processing um, and, and producing uh, lenses. So he's really into optics. And then uh, finally, he was also a director and partner in, in a glassworks factory, so he was also an entrepreneur. And this is um, also what, what we are trying to follow by doing um, research, by doing uh, R&D, for, especially for industry, being um, with this very applied by, by uh, yeah, working directly with industry and for industry. And there we have um, quite a few uh, examples um, that I will also come to again uh, that have been invented by different uh, institutes of, of the Fraunhofer Society, uh, which is, for instance, the well-known audio format MP3 or the white LED high-resolution thermal camera, or I will also come to the world record uh, solar cells in a minute. Yes, uh, the research volume of the Fraunhofer Society is about 2.9 billion euros annually. So we are one of the largest uh, research uh, institutions in, in Europe and also worldwide. And um, yeah, so certainly the, the uh, largest in Germany. Um, to show a bit of uh, yeah, where we are or how, how we work. On the one hand, we are based in Germany, but we have lots of partners around the world. Therefore, also here in, in Santiago de Chile, 
with the um, Fraunhofer Center for uh, for Research, um, and but they there are different uh, like partners uh, offices around the world uh, to get connected with industry everywhere. Um, we are yeah based on uh, seventy six institutes and research facilities. We have over uh, three hundred thousand employees, um, like with scientists mo mostly in Germany. But uh, beyond that, we extend also our uh, reach with the colleagues um, around the world and here in also here uh, to, to Chile. As I said, there is about 2.9 billion euros of annual research budget um, where we have, uh, yeah, most of that is being uh, from, from contract research. But let's not um, go too deep into this. I, I would like to go on uh, with a few inventions that uh, that are well known. So, in 1991, the MP3 audio format was uh, invented and is now widespread and everywhere used. And there is also uh, the white LED from the front of IAF, um, which is kind of uh, well known to me because it's also based in Freiburg, where um, I'm from. Uh, a small town in, in southwest Germany. And then there are two um, examples from the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems, um, which was uh, founded in, in 1981 to work uh, especially on PV at first. And uh, ever since and until now, um, we are always uh, among uh, the ones leading the world records in, in PV um, uh, efficiency. For instance, the world record monocrystalline silicon-based PV cell with 20, 26% that, that we hold since 2021. And a quite fresh one from the beginning of this year or like spring this year uh, with a new record uh, of 47.6% uh, for um, concentrator solar cell. Also at uh, frown of easy. Um, yeah, we are as I said, based in, in Freiburg, Germany, um, we have uh, currently two directors, which is Dr. Hans-Martin Henning and Dr. Andreas Bett. Um, I have uh, 1, 000, about 1,400 colleagues around, and like we at uh, Fraunhofer ESE have a total budget of 116.7 million for research that, that we are uh, like the, working on. Um, to say a few things about that, our, our revenue structure is mainly based on uh, federal government uh, funding, mostly with a project research um, that we comply together or that we work on together with industrial partners. But then there's also lots of direct uh, contracts with industry with about uh, one third where we uh, directly support industry with our applied research. Um, the rest, there, there are a few percent of like European Union um, uh, projects, uh, uh, European projects, there is a little bit of base funding and um, other smaller um, yeah, amounts. Um, at Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems, we have five main research areas. We have a very large one that is based on photovoltaics. Here we have an example of, uh, of the research, like the rather recent field of agrivoltaics uh, shown. Maybe I'll change for a pointer. So this is shown here on the left. Um, while this is a very like new and interesting field currently, um, I must say that already in 1983, there were the first publications from our institute in this regard. Then here, the second example is energy, energy efficient buildings, which goes from PV integration to heating systems, heat pumps, insulation, um, window systems, et cetera. So anything that, that is related um, to, to building integration and uh, yeah, energy efficiency here. I'll jump over to hydrogen technologies and electrical energy storage, where we also have a large department that is currently growing um, a lot since there is a, a new interest that was raised in the in the past few years, but um, we, uh, we are holding experience since a couple of decades already in um, development of fuel cells. We had the first um, hydrogen uh, petrol station, let's say petrol hydrogen station for uh, for cars in Freiburg, uh, in, like in, in that region. 
and is, is working since about 20 years already. Uh, and then there is also a large field in power electronics and smart, uh, smart systems uh, for uh, grids for uh, smaller or larger electronic systems. And then there is uh, here shown in the center, um, the, the um, business area for thermal, uh, solar thermal power plant and industrial processes um, where I am uh, based and where I will uh, talk more about right now. So our uh, main research topics are on the one hand, these uh, solar thermal power plants, um, then this concentrating solar collectors, which is uh, we have highly connected there. We have um, a, a group working on water treatment and separation, which is on the one hand for supplying fresh uh, water in, in areas where it's scarce, but on the other hand, it's also about um, separating uh, resources from uh, from wastewater uh, for more efficient uh, yeah, collection of, of um, scarce resources. Then there is uh, thermal energy storage for power plants and industry. So industry is a, a very important topic in this regard as well. I will show you in a bit later while. And yeah, in industry processes and process heat going into efficiency of uh, processes, interconnections of processes, and then efficient heat exchanges. Um, so uh, let me start with, with my main field, which is uh, the solar collectors. We have a variety of uh, options for solar collectors for different applications. Here we can see a, a temperature range um, that, that is connected to different applications from, from the industrial side or more relevant for the CSP, of course, for the power side. And therefore, um, for, each, for each type and temperature, there are uh, different kinds of collectors that could be applied and that, uh, that can produce um, like the or that can provide steam or heat at the relevant temperature um, for the respective process. So I will focus here rather on the higher temperatures because we are now working on or we are, we are focusing on the concentrating systems. There's also low concentrating systems for lower temperatures, but when we look at energy, then temperatures of above uh, 250 and um, towards the 600 degrees C is the most relevant. And for, for uh, like lower TRL or also higher um, temperatures are relevant. There we have um, on the one hand parabolic trough um, collectors, which are very mature, as well as uh, linear Fresnel collectors which span like a temperature range from between um, like 200 until uh, 580 degrees, where at this uh, 580 degrees, we, we have also these, these uh, central receiver systems, the towers here with an um, exemplary image of uh, the power plant here in Chile, Cerro Dominador. For higher temperatures, um, currently, rather focused for, um, for industrial processes, like high temperature processes. There is also uh, tower systems or maybe even dish systems that, that could be applied, but tower systems are the most um, cost-effective um, at, the, at the current state. But here at this higher temperatures, gas turbines uh, could also be a very good solution for um, energy production. But when we look at the state of the art, then we are here rather in the steam, tur steam turbine temperature range um, together with a um, combination of, of molten salt. New topics are, um, um, are CO2 cycles, um, etc. So one very important aspect of uh, these thermal power plants is also the, the storages. Because uh, with uh, CSP, we have the, the ability to um, store the heat that we collect over the day from the solar energy resource into um, a molten salt storage, which is state of the art for parabolic trough, or also tower plants, um, or for higher temperatures, pack bed storages are being investigated currently. For um, lower temperature processes, 
There are other uh, like water and ice storage for, for really like cold storage, pressurized water, PCM storage, or um, higher temperature PCM storages that could also be applied for certain industrial applications. But focusing here on, um, on the power production, there is uh, molten salt as um, the, the mature technology that we are also working in. The, the high opportunities or the, the uh, yeah, that that we get from from this uh, technology is that we can store energy for long time. That means more than four hours, um, up to the whole night, or even until the next day, um, to provide solar energy even at night. And therefore, we can really um, replace fossil fuels um, by solar energy. This brings me now um, to like to focus on um, my group I'm I'm working in and that I'm leading since uh, one and a half years, where um, we start with uh, the optical side. Later we will come back to the thermal side again. So with uh, this group concentrating collectors and optics, we have one focus in computer vision applications uh, for CSP that can help uh, optimizing the operation um, quite a bit. I will show you how. There is, um, in, in, in CSP, we have lots of heliostats for tower sensors. We have lots of heliostats that focus the, the light, the sunlight, to a central receiver system. These heliostats, they need to, to uh, aim very precisely over like ranges of up to a kilometer or even more. That means that they have to be very precisely controlled. In order to do so, they need to be uh, calibrated. Uh, usually they have to be calibrated uh, quite a few times over a year, but um, these, these plants feature uh, several thousands of heliostats, which takes quite a while to, to uh, calibrate. Usually this takes up to two weeks. So here in, in my group, we have developed um, a, a camera-based method that would um, that, that would observe where each of these heliostats is looking at in uh, at the receiver while it is in operation, while there is overlapping um, the, the overlapping light. It is so bright that you can't even distinguish usually. But with a means of computer vision, you can distinguish where each of the heliostats focuses and correct. This is again like an example of uh, how we work at Fraunhofer, where we start with a theory. Um, develop um, the, the idea to a first workable uh, product that was then tested in our laboratories and with a very small setup and then was um, uh, brought forward for the experimental assessment. In this case here, it was uh, tested at a research facility in France at the uh, Institute uh, CNRS Promise in the Pyrenees in France, where we could uh, actually apply this the first time. Here, the aim is uh, to, to establish a very fast aim point detection that is uh, useful during commissioning, where we can speed up uh, comm commissioning and calibration from, uh, from two weeks or from a month reduce it uh, to several hours or even below one hour, um, uh, yeah, possibly. So this is one example of a like, smart system where we allow for parallel calibration of uh, several heliostats at once, which is currently done sequentially, which is fast because we can measure of up to two aim points per second instead of uh, several minutes per uh, heliostat. It is kind of simple uh, if it is if, if you have it because it can be plugged into an existing um, heliostat field with with a little bit of adaption but very little and uh, with without interfering uh, too much with the actual and uh, safety relevant um, heliostat con control and it has been uh, tested and demonstrated in an experimentally in this plant in in France the next step that we are following here is the demonstration and commercial scale uh, to be able then to provide it um, to industry to use. Um, another topic is the, the assessment of central receivers. Like the central receiver here again 
um, like in, in small, we have uh, the receiver of the tower, is a very critical um, part of the whole system. We have this heliostat field of thousands of heliostat that concentrate the light to this receiver where all the heat is collected and then forwarded with a heat transfer medium to, um, to the power block and to the storage. If the receiver is not working well, we are we might lose efficiency on the one hand, and uh, if it might fail, then the whole plant needs to stop. So this is a very critical part of the whole plant. Um, one one uh, yeah, technology we have been working on is to assess the optical um, quality of the rec receiver uh, during night or when the plant is not in operation by uncalibrated light sources. You don't want to uh, go up to this tower that is several hundred meters above ground and uh, measure um, a lot by hand because it is a lot of, of effort. Therefore, um, we have developed a camera-based method that allows uh, the, the measurement from ground and using the heliostats or an, um, an artificial light source for, for um, this assessment. Questions that we want to answer is, when is the best time to recode, meaning to apply a new uh, absorber paint for, um, for improved absorption and efficiency of the receiver and to detect whether there are any damages um, that occurred over time. For this, uh, we have developed a very fast uh, way of measuring it, where we scan the receiver surface um, with uh, with a yeah, light with a light source, um, where we, we do not need to scan every point of the of the receiver individually, but we can use the full size of such a spot, and by an intelligent way of over crossing uh, several um, or like two movements, sometimes it's uh, it's three movements of heliostats, we are able to derive um, the the uh, bidirectional reflectance. Um, of the receiver from any point of the field. Also, this method has been uh, tested in the lab and has been validated against um, a, a 3D photogoniometer in, uh, in the uh, laboratory. Now the next step is from validation to apply it again to uh, the real uh, receivers and therefore support uh, operators in observing uh, efficiency and quality of the receiver. This brings me forward uh, to qualification and, and of system performance for um, central receiver systems, but also for linear concentrators. Here, for instance, we see um, a um, linear Fresnel plant that, that we have also uh, investigated. In the back, you can also see uh, a tower system that is nearby that was not focused um, of this, of this uh, study here, but in this case, this is for a linear Fresnel system. Here, um, we have developed um, a method that we call the parameter identification that allows us to uh, do a performance validation on site. As compared to smaller systems like flat plate collectors or also PV panels that you can um, dismount or take into the laboratory to test, um, for CSP systems, we usually have very large sizes. You cannot bring them into the laboratory and um, investigate them under uh, very stable and controllable conditions, but you have to test them in their real surrounding. Therefore, um, we, we have uh, developed a method to use measurement data um, from, from the site where it is um, installed to uh, to test under very under different um, operating conditions how this this um, collector behaves. Um, we copy the behavior by modeling and therefore identify the performance parameters. We do this in situ on the one hand. We we work with dynamic uh, behavior here. We don't need stable conditions, but we work with um, with the, with the dynamic behavior that occurs in a real world with clouds passing, with changing uh, light conditions, with changing temperatures, with uh, changing uh, sun positions. 
um, and we do a full statistical assessment of these test results in order to assess um, the full quality of this uh, system and therefore can report on the performance. This um, yeah, improves the, the reliability of, of the system, of also of comparison between different suppliers, and it reduces effort, time, and cost for testing because it can be done where the collector is installed. Well, um, besides these on-site testing technologies that we develop, we also um, develop other measurement um, equipment and we apply techniques in our labs. I will focus today for, uh, on, on um, systems that are most relevant for the application in the field, not so much on our laboratory. So, here, now that I said I won't focus so much on the lab, I start with the lab again, where we do a lot of dust analysis. This dust analysis is very relevant in the field again, because every site has um, a different type of dust that can, um, yeah, that can change the plant behavior quite a bit. But in order to, to assess it in the field, we have developed um, a flexible field measurement device, the PFLEX, which is a reflectometer which is very handy on site to measure. I will come back to it. Then we, uh, we also have developed um, a, the Avos remote site monitoring system, which also measures the impact of soiling on CSP plants or on, C on future CSP sites. Another important aspect for uh, site qualification is um, the, the knowledge on the CSR, which is the circumsolar ratio, meaning um, we, we have the sun that is um, like the source of the, of the energy we want to use, but due to atmospheric effects, the sun um, may have uh, some, some corona around it um, with uh, some of the scattered light or light that is scattered in the atmosphere, parts of it being scattered um, uh, yeah, around the sky, so you cannot collect it, it's rather diffusely, and parts of it is forward scattered, that it could still be collected. On the other hand, some measurement devices like perheliometers that we use to, to measure the direct normal radiance would also capture this amount. If we want to know what amount of light we can actually uh, utilize with our technology, we need to have further knowledge on the angular distribution of the light that is coming. Therefore, we have this uh, circum solar ratio camera. Here, this, this sun shape can be measured uh, with a half angle of zero to, to two degrees with an uncertainty of about 1.5%, uh, which reduces uncertainty from uh, from from the side um, a lot of um, as compared of what what we uh, have with only the measurement of perheliometers. Like the spatial resolution is uh, 0.1 milli radians. Especially for tower systems, this can be of interest because because the heliostats are a very various distance to the receiver. The further the heliostat is away, the more impact we have of um, this differentiation of the sun shape. The, the camera is um, yeah, designed to operate in, uh, in like a large range, so it can also be used in, in deserts, while we still need to improve a bit on the negative temperatures. So next is the portable reflectometer. Uh, where uh, that, that can be used to assess soiling rates and um, uh, reflectance in the field. This handheld device is, uh, can be connected to a mobile phone in order to collect quickly um, all, the, all the measurements uh, and also do a pre-evaluation of um, the measurements that are, that are taken. So it is, it is quite handy. You can go around and, and uh, measure without a lot of... Um, like stabilizing and, and uh, arranging for it, which makes it very handy. This, uh, this device, or let's say the optics of this device was developed by us, um, but then it was further developed by um, a company that has also commercialized the system already. 
this automatic and independent uh, site monitoring system, AVUS, is still under development. So we are still running a project um, where we uh, further investigate and further develop um, the system. Currently, um, three of them are installed in um, a power plant in Kuwait. Um, this device is monitoring long-term cleanliness and soiling rates um, over like autonomously that means every hour it would measure the the soiling rate which can then be uh, used to to calculate usually daily soiling rates in order um, to on the one hand predict for uh, remote sites um, what is the impact of soiling for future plants or to support uh, the staff at the operation um with uh, yeah with the knowledge of impact of sandstorms or just the daily normal soiling in order to improve um, cleaning cycles in power plants so this uh, system does not need a lot of maintenance as compared to to other optical measurement systems that need to be cleaned every day and so on this one can easily work uh, one or two weeks without um, any maintenance um, re remotely So here I have one, one little example of how it works, just to, to show you with three of them that are currently installed also in, in Freiburg at our um, outdoor testing field. We have this arm that is once an hour moving down to this opening where um, the, the reflectance of the sample that is installed here and exposed is being measured and compared to, um, yeah, to, to a reference. All the time in between, uh, the sample is being exposed and therefore collects as much dust as, um, as a collector that is standing nearby. So with this um, device, it is not necessary to go around the field and measure um, each and every collector um, every day in order to predict the performance of the plant or in order to, to uh, yeah, predict the impact of soiling in, in remote sites. Looking back to the plants that are currently install, installed worldwide, and with this experience, it, it, is, uh, it has become obvious that um, soiling is an important factor for sites and should be considered in, um, in the assessment of sites. So not only the direct normal irradiance, like the main solar source that we use is relevant, but also the amount of soiling that leads to scattering and therefore um, like a lack of control of how to concentrate the solar resource. Here there, there is an example of um, the soiling rate uh, of this AVOS device that was measured. Over time, we can see that the, the cleanliness, meaning um, also, the optical efficiency of um, a, a collector can drop down with the time. So this would give you an indication of when to clean, how to clean, uh, or whether it is more efficient to wait another day until uh, you send out the trucks for the, the trucks or the, the um, staff to clean the mirrors. Besides this, um, the, the knowledge of only one spot, if distributed, you can also measure the distribution of soiling in um, a full power plant. And maybe you do not uh, have the full spatial resolution because you would need too many, um, too many sites, but together with a bit of knowledge of the, of the uh, impacts from the plant of wind directions, um, you can establish a, a very good model of um, soiling distribution that tell you where to clean more often as compared to other regions where you do not need to clean that often. This can reduce the, the, the um, like efforts for cleaning um, a lot. I will come back to this right here. So this, um, this map for um, soiling um, occurrences that is, is one uh, input that we can use again in order uh, to simulate and, and to uh, evaluate the, the efficiency, the optical, and then also thermal efficiency of a single collector in a field. Let's just pick just one. But this can also be extended to a full loop of such a collector. 
such a loop is usually the like the unit where from the one side where the the header the, the cold um, heat transfer media is being supplied it passes this loop and then it is collected again um, like after it has been heated up by these collectors with uh, an, a knowledge on uh, the soiling rate you can um, yeah, predict well what is the temperature that you have on the other side and you can uh, also apply your control in order to to have the best temperatures there this is not only true for a single loop but this is true for all the loops in a subsystem or in the full system and therefore you it is possible to optimize the temperature outlet for your storage and power block uh, operation So this helps us um, to develop optimized mirror cleaning schedules. Um, it, it also helps us to, to improve cleaning cycles. We, we, we can uh, reduce the water consumptions of these uh, power plants that are usually local, uh, located in deserts and areas where uh, water is a scarce resource. And um, yeah, it, it helps us to, to do, develop a water management for the full uh, CSP uh, plants in, in the total. The, this, this information can be used to identify different and optimal cleaning strategies. We have compared these um, coming from like the normal um, in state-of-the-art cleaning uh, strategy, which allows in a an, in an fixed interval um, cleaning, let's say, once per week, uh, or sometimes it's even less, where uh, which is just the time that is needed in order to clean a full uh, power plant with, with a certain amount of trucks. This is what is usually being applied without further knowledge. Um, we have investigated um, to, to other um, options for, for cleaning. One of that is a cleaning threshold, meaning if cleaning or if the state of the collector goes uh, beyond a certain state, then it is being cleaned. That means uh, any loop with a certain cleanliness below a fixed threshold would be prioritized among others, which is already a, a far improvement um, upon just cleaning um, in, in a regular schedule, no matter whether it's clean or not. But then there is um, an even uh, like a better version that we have identified, which is uh, applying a variable cleaning threshold that is also depending on forecasting of, um, of the like weather forecasting and also availability and, and uh, water, um, like the water resource. Here is showing uh, this example uh, again. So this, the, the, the threshold for cleaning in this case would um, depend on the radiation potential of the next uh, day on the rain forecast greater than six millimeters, meaning there might be an, a cleaning, natural cleaning. If it's below six millimeter, you might have a very strong soiling event, by the way. And it also, which is that stated here, is also dependent on um, the storage, um, like the, the, the storage capacity, how full is it already. This um, allowed us to optimize the water consumption and reduce uh, usage of uh, almost 20%, um, the fuel consumption for the trucks by 20%. The, the costs for um, operation of the plant, uh, for, for the cleaning, especially for the cleaning, by more than 20%, and uh, the levelized cost of cleaning per kilowatt hour by, um, yeah, by one uh, quarter already. So there is a high potential for uh, cost reduction um, in the operation of power plants. It is also relevant to, to Chile. Here you can see that we have a strong interconnection between measurement and modeling. And uh, modeling, therefore, is also one of our uh, focuses in, um, or one, one of, of the focus in, in this group, where we have a strong tool chain coming from optical simulation towards um, the, the like 
the simulation of the thermal um, cycle and chill power plant and uh, electrical grids. Um, our tool chain here, um, yeah, is is based on like a, a simple and fast component uh, and system design tool that we can use to start uh, to start like the a design. Then it would feature and be more um, let's say uh, detailed with an optical modeling. We saw a picture here in the in the in the background of our uh, developed uh, ray tracing software with which we can um, model uh, yeah, small and, and, and large systems, I will come back to it, which then features um, the, the dynamic system simulation or quasi-dynamic system simulation, COLSIM, as CSP, um, a tool that we, are, that, that we have also developed at uh, the Institute and we are using for our optimization. And then, of course, the techno-economic evaluation and optimization uh, tool chain, which is then again looping back to the different steps um, for iterative optimization through the whole tool chain uh, to uh, allow for optimized uh, plant layouts or operation strategies, as I showed before. Um, yeah, one one example for this uh, device. For, for the for the component system design is also um, a very flexible uh, heliostat field layout, which um, allows us to to define a certain area where uh, a, a power plant could be built, and then optimizes for us what would be the the optimal layout of such a plant um, by different evolutions. In this case. Um, or in this, this example that you can see here on, on the left, um, a location was chosen in, in uh, like southern Europe, which is still not that, that southern and not that close to, to the equator, such um, that it results in a polar field as compared to a more um, surrounding field that is also a possible solution. Um, this, uh, yeah, the, the, the field layout would then um, feed into um, a pre-layout of the full system that can then be further optimized. On the optical side, we, we can do very detailed simulations for uh, different kinds of systems, be it uh, linear Fresnel collectors, um, including um, yeah, all installations and shading elements, um, or it could also be large heliostat fields and towers, um, with thousands of, uh, of elements, or it can also be very uh, small and uh, microscopic systems like concentrator uh, photovoltaics or light trapping structures um, that, that can be used in absorbing materials or, um, or PV. Um, the dynamic system simulation um, is uh, yeah, compromises everything after collection of uh, the solar resource with the interface of this uh, of this absorber, where we can see here an example of um, yeah, of a dynamic simulation where we have the the solar radiance over time for uh, four days here simulated um, for uh, a tower system that is has a similar capacity to the NUR-3 plant that is in, in Morocco, or was Zazate, he also chosen as the site, but with a different layout. In this case, we, we have chosen 70,000 heliostats um, instead of the 7,400 that are installed. So the year, in this case, it's smaller heliostats, um, but the receiver capacity would be the same. Um, this solar uh, radiance, uh, the, the direct normal irradiance uh, can then be translated into also features like the, the mass flow of the HTF that would be optimum for this operation, depending also on um, like what, what uh, solar resource we have available. And here we can see on the one hand the, um, the, the HTF coming from the receiver on the, to, to the storage, so coming from the receiver here to the storage, uh, to the storage tank, sorry. Um, 
but then also what is being delivered to, um, to the power block. And in this case, um, we can also define different uh, power block operation strategies. In this case, it was just full operation as long as possible with the defined uh, storage. Here also, we can see the storage capacity that is uh, slightly, in this case, slightly um, over-designed, I would say a bit, a bit too large because we can only fill, fill this storage uh, on one day, on the other days, um, we cannot reach full capacity and therefore only uh, shorter, um, yeah, shorter operation times. On the other hand, if a different operation strategy was chosen, we could also reach the 24-7 uh, uh, production as well. Um, and then it also features all uh, the, the temperature, be it um, receiver outlet temperature, cold and cold, uh, cold storage temperature that can be optimized um, for operation. Yes, uh, and then finally, uh, we can of course also see all the, the energy flows from one component to, uh, to the next and investigate where losses occur and uh, where we can improve the system. Um, in order to, to do these um, detailed simulations, um, we, we do not do like only the full system simulation, but here we have an interface that is very detailed again, that we can um, yeah, use to, to investigate the plant performance. Um, here we have the example of a central receiver system with different, um, like the different panels, which one panel uh, is in this case um, like a, a bundle of, um, of pipes as shown maybe here on the, on the side of, of pipes that would, um, th through which the HTF is, is uh, flowing. And um, here we see the example or the, the, the model of um, a, a single pipe and um, how energy is being transferred. We have on the one hand, the absorbed energy on the surface, um, which results in a surface temperature, which then is being transmitted through the wall into uh, the temperature um, of the film. So the inner tube or in inner tube temperature or outer HTF temperature. So here in the middle, you will have the HTF temperature. And then finally, in the top, we would see the, the temperature of the, of the fluid itself. And this can be uh, modeled. Here we can see uh, for every minute uh, of the day um, how the, the absorption uh, leads to the temperature, film temperature or fluid temperature in, um, in a very detailed uh, manner with, uh, with these tools. I will come back later to this picture here because this would also contribute, contrib yeah, show the, the tool chain that we are um, using with the whole system again. So here we can, we can investigate exactly how does the absorption lead uh, to, the, to the fluid temperature, where, to, where do we actually exceed um, nominal, nominal temperatures that are relevant for material, um, yeah, for, for the material parameters what the um, receiver can withstand actually, um, but also we can improve the, the aim point strategy and advise uh, where, where necessary to, to operators or designers. All these tools um, are then used also to, to investigate um, different sites and um, for instance, here also one study that we've done together with the colleagues here in Chile, um, for Chile again, where we have um, compared different, um, different uh, possible sites and optimized uh, systems for uh, these sites. In this case, you can see here um, an optimization graph for uh, a plant in Nueva Saldivar with um, different uh, field sizes, with different um, uh, thermal uh, storage sizes for, for different numbers of temperatures. Then of course, also including um, the assumptions of, of that base on, on material costs, et cetera. 
which would help us to, to distinguish which plant uh, layout is best for, for uh, yeah, which place. In this case, we found an optimum um, um, over here in this with a with a green line with a bit be, below um, five cents, five point uh, six cents um, or euro cents per kilowatt hours. Sorry, I don't have it in pesos. Um, yeah, with um, yeah storage capacity of twelve point five hours and um, with an uh, optic, optical multiple, meaning an oversized field of only 1.1 uh, 1 in this case. Again, prices here are subject to uh, the assumptions taken for the like, component costs, et cetera. It can be very different um, depending on market and supply. So we know that there have been already uh, offers for uh, lower than that or bids look for lower than that. Um, so here, now I, I would like to, to talk ab about uh, some projects that we are currently working on. One of that is called Smart CSP, that is also taking these different aspects I was mentioning before into account, uh, where we look um, especially on the optimization of the full power plant, including uh, power block and storage cooling system and solar field. But here we have an, an, a special focus on the solar solar field and the cooling system in order to improve efficiency here <clears throat> um, based on extended sensor integration. Meaning on the one hand, we use all information that is available. On the other hand, we investigate whether um, further sensors might uh, help to, to improve operation of the plant. This operation, is not, um, or this 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 extension is not only um, featured by we measure and look at the data, or we we look at precise now casting. We extend the knowledge that we get from from uh, sensors by CFD based uh, state prediction. And then everything is combined uh, in artificial intelligent base of so big data, um, referring into a black box model that helps us to uh, investigate plant behavior. Meaning on the one hand, we can forecast how would this uh, plant behave under a certain um, circumstance, like weather, cleaning event, a soiling event, temperature changes, clouds passing on the one hand. Um, on, on the other hand, um, this is also, shall also be used to predict failures. Let's say for instance, whether um, an absorber tube uh, envelope is, is broken or whether a certain uh, yeah, collector is tracking not as, not as good as expected. Or maybe we have hydrogen into the in the evacuated tube, etc. So these kinds of uh, failures should be predicted and therefore um, also given as information to the operator in order to adapt operation or maybe also to repair and improve the plant again to reach uh, yeah, best efficiencies. So, right, this, um, like these measurements are again interlinked with the devices that we develop, be it um, the, the soiling sensor or also the solar resource assessment. Um, but then it's not only applied to, to this example, of uh, parabolic troughs that we are working on, but we are also working on the on the optimization and digital twin development um, for uh, central receiver systems. Here we have slightly different challenges. We don't have the solar field with a distributed um, collection um, as we have it in the um, in the parabolic trough, but we have the the very central collector, um, the the central receiver where on the one hand, we simulate with our uh, quasi-dynamic uh, modeling tools how a receiver would behave. We, we plan to measure it, uh, the, the fluid temperature, but also the surface temperature, improve measurement here. Um, we, we plan on uh, investigating the exact aim points, but then also predict the exact flux distribution, which is a huge challenge when, um, yeah, when, when considering thousands of failures that's, that are overlapping, where you cannot really distinguish. 
Well, this is um, my like the the, the main uh, things I wanted to tell about the about CSP for the moment. But in my uh, business area, I'm not only working on the on the solar thermal power plants um, section, but also um, in this very relevant um, in industry in process heat uh, section, where we can provide with our uh, concentrating uh, collectors like energy for um, any any or like many different projects uh, processes and just as a bit of of uh, a background um industry is a um yeah well for industry it usually is a high challenge to adapt to um to low carbon um yeah consumption let's say um, because there we have a lot of heat that is being used, a lot of electricity that is being used, like here, that is the, the global share and consumption of, of energy in total, and the industrial uh, part takes already almost one third. Uh, industry usually has um, processes that are that are well established and you want to have them running. So you, you do not want to interfere too much is the your your main process should work you should provide um the the products that are being uh yeah developed that are being that are being produced in a very stable manner you don't want to have downtimes or some uh, something like that so um and and a, a large share of what is being uh being used here is actually heat a heat that can be easily uh, provided by um, concentrating systems, um, especially since we have uh, from from the seed, we have a large share, like uh, seventy percent of that being in the range between one hundred fifty and um, even above four hundred degrees C, where we can um, yeah use solar heat with uh, with storage um, yeah uh, very well. Besides. Besides applying um, the, the concentrating heat, of course, there is also other options like energy efficiency measures that should be uh, that should be used. We can um, electrify uh, certain uh, certain aspects. We can um, yeah we, we can uh, look for for processes that are nearby but not not yet interlinked and how they are being integrated. So this is also one um, important aspects of the work at our institute. Yeah, so uh, to, to have a bit on a look on, on the distribution, we in the chemical industry, there is a, a huge amount of energy that is being used at high temperatures. So for the solar uh, thermal, um, an interesting, very interesting field of work. Uh, also in food and beverages, machinery, mining, textile, well, especially mining and chemical industry is uh, like also uh, there is high potential uh, in, in Chile and the large potentials for de-fossilization, uh, um, especially with these amounts of resource that you have available here, uh, where I speak on solar resource in this case. Yeah, this brings me back to this uh, earlier picture. Where you can see that uh, with CSP, like power for for uh, twenty four seven uh, electricity demand, or CST, like thermal energy, for also twenty four seven thermal energy um, yeah, provision. We are we we have the tools available that are mature, and um, that can be that can be used. And where yeah, we can we as Fraunhofer are happy to support industry here that is developing. Um, these solutions, um, yeah, for for Chilean electricity grid and um, and industry. So yeah, I think that the the storage thing I, I said already, um, but then also on on the storage side, uh, we can uh, we we can support on um, yeah on Gregor, the solar. Gregor, uh, two two minutes, please. All right. Then I, I might just uh, <laughs> jump over. I think I'm I'm just about to finish. Uh, thank you. I don't unfortunately I don't have the time in, in my view. <laughs> okay, and then let me jump over. 
um, coming back to these main fields of, of our research from the solar uh, island to uh, plant and storage and system evaluation that uh, I wanted to bring up again for, for summarizing the presentation um, on, on our research. I would be happy also to receive your questions. Um, but besides, yeah, I have two examples of things I did not mention. If you're interested, uh, and if, if you happen to go to the solar bases next, or like after next week, um, there will be a presentation of my colleague um, Wolf Spitterling on high temperature receiver solutions here, an air curtain to to improve uh, or to to reduce convective losses, or also from my colleague Metani Ferreres um, on uh, yeah dense fast and dense uh, yes scanning scanning technique for assessment of soiling or cleanliness in solar fields. But with this, I would like to finish and thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to answer a few questions if you have them, if we have the time. Hi, Gregor. Um, excellent, excellent. Absolutely. Um, it is amazing how things could be done, uh, especially in this field. Um, first, I would like to say thank you to some, uh, some people who are connected. We have people connected from France, Germany, Denver, Colorado, uh, Australia, Mexico, Chile. Chile for University of Santiago and University of Santa Maria and few many others. So thank you for joining us. Um, Gregor, we have some questions, but one you have already uh, answered regarding um, how this can optimize CSP efficiency, but you already mentioned that it can reduce the cleaning and also it can reduce water consumption or also it can reduce uh, OPEX of, uh, of the project. So. For those people who ask this one, um, this recording will be available in our website. Uh, so after the, 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 the presentation of Gregor, you can find again the presentation. But we have another question here, Gregor. It said, each CSP has a unique heliostat size. It means the heliostat, for example, in Chile, we have a, a zero dominator with 140 uh, square meters. Right now, the heliostat is much smaller. 20, 60, 50, and 80, it depends of each site. How this can affect the study, for example? Um, the, the study, yeah. So um, the, the helios that size is mainly affecting, um, or I would say the, the choice for a size of the helios that is an economic decision mainly. Um, from, from an optical point of view, um, there, there are good reasons for larger heliostats or smaller heliostats, um, but the, the um, let's say the economics behind, which is again um, very different for each supplier, or they might they may have very a very different cost structure, um, would decide on the size of heliostats. But it could we be, have it seen could be in used, the past. But it could be used. It doesn't matter the size of the heliostat. It could be used in the big ones or the small ones, right? You, you mean the the, the modeling uh, yes. tool service? Yes. Or is that, yes, we can we can model anything from very small to very large. Okay, it, it doesn't is, depend um, on the size. The size is millimeters not millimeters to okay. um, yeah, hundred and forty square meters is this is yeah pretty much the largest heliostats that are in in operation currently. Um, yes, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah but um, yeah, from, from the tools, yeah. um, all, all of that can be, um, yeah, can be investigated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Once again, Gregor, excellent presentation and many thanks to join us and uh, be part of this webinar. Thanks, Fran Hofer, for joining us. Mm -hmm. And thanks to all the people who stayed here. And once again, this will be this recorded and the PPT will be available in ACSP website and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks again, Gregor. Uh, have a good presentation in Solar Places and have a good luck. And thanks to everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you very much also for, for having